Welcome. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast, the show that cuts through the fog of war and updates you about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. With your host, Linnea Hubbard. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts. I'm Linnea Hubbard and today is Friday, November 18th, 2022. It's been 3,187 days since Russia occupied Crimea on February 27, 2014, and 268 days since the large-scale invasion of Ukraine began. Today's podcast looks at what happened yesterday in the Russia-Ukraine war. The Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War update is compiled by our team from around the world. Today's report includes information from direct contacts in Ukraine and their proxies, Russian Ministry of Defense reports, The General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine reports, Operational Command South of Ukraine, Open Source Intelligence, our in-house team of analysts and geolocation experts, and pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian mill bloggers and social media accounts with a track record of trying to be accurate. We have one mission, to report the truth, because the truth matters. Let's start with our assessment of the current status of the war. First, our assessment that massive retaliatory attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure would continue this week was accurate, with another wave of missile and drone attacks across Ukraine. Second, our assessment that significant war crimes and atrocities will be discovered in Kherson this week was regrettably accurate. Third, We maintain that the slowdown in combat operations on multiple axes is a mirage, with intense fighting creating little progress. Both belligerents have significant military assets they can reallocate to new axes. Fourth, we maintain that neither belligerent will institute a winter pause. Fifth, we maintain that President Putin's inner circle is actively targeting Russian Minister of Defense Sergei Shoigu for dismissal and replacement, due to continued military failures in Ukraine. Sixth, we maintain that Russian President Vladimir Putin is facing renewed unrest inside and outside the Kremlin. If there continue to be military failures, there is a remote chance Russia could face a regime change. Seventh, we maintain that the Russian military within Ukraine is combat ineffective and can only mount effective defensive operations. Eighth, Our assessment that the Russian Ministry of Defense would likely concentrate its available firepower on a small area was accurate, with more troops being deployed to the Avdiivka salient. Russian forces will likely continue to make gains, but at the expense of moving to a combat-destroyed state as in Severodonetsk, Lusychansk. Ninth, we maintain that the private military company Wagner Group is spread too thin due to its expanding role in the Donetsk Oblast, and the revelation of crippling battlefield losses. Tenth, we maintain that Ukraine holds the battlefield initiative, forcing Russian troops to remain in a defensive posture. And finally, we maintain that Russian forces in Belarus remain a credible threat for an invasion of western Ukraine, but we now assess the possibility has pushed further out to the next 50 to 80 days. Let's get some regional updates, starting with Kherson and Zaporizhia. Russian and Ukrainian forces continue to trade artillery and rockets fired by multiple launch rocket systems, or MLRS, along the Dnipro River, with neither belligerent launching offensive operations. Russian forces are increasingly targeting recently liberated Kherson and its suburbs, moving from targeting military assets to civilians and civilian infrastructure. Well, can't say they're not consistent. Tornobaevka, Antonivka, and Kherson were shelled, with residential and office buildings damaged and one civilian killed. Ukraine continues to interdict multiple Russian ground lines of communication, called GLOX, those are supply lines, east of the Dnipro using precision-guided Excalibur shells and rockets fired from HIMARS. Verifiable details are hard to get because the strikes are deep behind the line of conflict near Crimea, and the massive damage to Ukraine's internet cellular and electrical infrastructure has reduced social intelligence. In Russian-occupied Novokhovka, a radar station was destroyed, and Russian military equipment was attacked in Holopristan. Russian-occupied Chaplinka was struck by rockets fired by HIMARS, destroying an ammunition depot. Secondary explosions were recorded. 
During the overnight hours of November 16th, Russian forces entered the occupied town of Novokivka and forcibly deported the town's residents. Russian occupation officials are systematically destroying the cellular communications network in the Kakhovka rayon and mining key infrastructure facilities. Russian forces also closed the hospitals in Novokakhovka, moving patients, staff, and equipment to Russian-occupied Crimea. Some assessment here. Military commanders don't relocate hospitals unless they're concerned about losing the territory or plan to withdraw. Russian forces continue to build defensive positions along the Crimea-Kherson administrative border and as far away as 60 kilometers from the line of conflict in Zaporizhia. Convoys of vehicles are arriving in Melitopol hauling prefabricated concrete bunkers and half-height dragon's teeth, which, at least in theory, are used as tank obstacles. Satellite images showed Russian combat engineers were building extensive defensive positions in Chikolov, 55 kilometers from the line of conflict. The town of Vilnyansk in Free Ukraine, about 20 kilometers east of Zaporizhia, was struck by Russian missiles, destroying a two-story apartment building and killing four civilians as they slept. Another nearby settlement was hit by an S-300 anti-aircraft missile used for a ground attack, landing outside the Palace of Culture and causing significant damage. The General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, or GSAFU, reported that a Russian command center was destroyed in Melitopol on November 15th when the location was hit by rockets fired by HIMARS. No further details were given, and we cannot confirm the veracity of the report. There was light rain throughout the day and scattered artillery fire from the Zaporizhia Donetsk administrative border to Huliapola to Orekhiv to Mali Shirbaki. Assessment here. While Russian forces are increasing combat operations on at least one axis, they appear to be digging in for the winter in Kherson and Zaporizhia, moving to a purely defensive posture. Building defensive structures 50 to 70 kilometers behind the known line of conflict acknowledges a real concern from Russian military leaders that Ukraine could break through the current line of conflict. It is also an admission that Russian military commanders don't have a counterbattery solution for NATO-provided 155 millimeter Excalibur shells, which have a range of 40 to 42 kilometers. Most defensive structures being built are within range of M30 and M31 rockets used by M142, those are HIMARS, M270 and Mars 2 launchers. Repeated tactical strikes on distributed positions by HIMARS make little sense. Now to the Donbass region, starting with southwest Donetsk. There is conflicting information on the status of Pavlivka, the Russian Ministry of Defense claims that Russian forces have occupied the town and taken control of the T-509 highway. Ukrainian sources maintain that Russian troops cannot cross the highway because Ukrainian forces maintain fire control over the northern half of Pavlivka. We have not adjusted our map, which maintains that Russian forces currently occupy the settlement. The general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine hasn't mentioned the town in the last 36 hours, further reinforcing that Ukrainian troops have withdrawn. The GSAFU and Russian mill blogger Rybar reported that the 1st Army Corps of the Donetsk People's Republic, or DNR, continued to throw troops at the eastern outskirts of Novomikhailivka without any change in the situation. Fighting is intensifying west of Donetsk, with more experienced Russian units entering the battle. The arrival of forces beyond Mobix and the conscripts of the 1st Army Corps has resulted in difficult conditions for Ukrainian troops. There are renewed claims that Opitna has been captured, but remembering the repeated claims that Pisky was occupied that lasted for 82 whole days and the use of a convincing fake victory video last week, we're reluctant to update the map. Further, the GSAFU reported continued fighting in Opitne, suggesting the town is a contested no-man's land. Russian forces continue to attempt to advance into Pervomaiske without success. Russian forces have been stuck near the E-50 ring road for almost three months and suffered catastrophic losses for very little gain. Fighting for control of the Ukrainian firebase at Nevelske continued and was described as intense by both belligerents. Fighting for control of Vodyana also continued. 
also with no change in the situation. It's an assessment here. Just as they did in August, Russian forces broke off their attempts to advance on Novokalinova after three days of trying. The Ukrainian stronghold in Krasnohorivka will be extremely difficult to capture due to its location on a plateau surrounded by natural water barriers. If Russian forces want to capture Avdiivka, they have to take Krasnohorivka first, because its strategic location provides fire control over a wide area. The People's Militia of the DNR Public Relations Channel claimed it destroyed another 38 pieces of Ukrainian equipment over the last 48 hours, with not a single little tiny bit of evidence. Their reports were unsupported by data provided by the Russian MOD as well. They also reported that Ukraine carried out 134 fire strikes on the occupied territories. East of Donetsk, Ilovysk was hit by rockets fired by HIMARS, according to social media reports. The railroad station was reportedly targeted and suffered severe damage. Pavlo Kirilenko, Donetsk Oblast administrative and military governor, reported only sporadic shelling in Vulidar and quote chaotic shelling in the eastern parts of Marinka and Avdiivka. East of Avdiivka and near the line of conflict, the town of Yasinovatsa was hit by missiles or rockets fired by HIMARS. In Russian-occupied Mariupol, a repair base for Russian military hardware exploded, resulting in the detonation of ammunition. Partisans reported the blast was caused by an industrial accident and not related to sabotage or an attack. Sometimes smoking accidents just happen. Electrical service failed in several areas of Mariupol due to bad weather and poor quality repairs to electrical infrastructure over the summer. A transformer exploded in the Primorsky district, knocking out power for up to 30 days. Another series of explosions in the city's eastern part knocked out power and destroyed ammunition storage. Occupation officials report that the blasts were caused by air defense missiles, while three Russian soldiers were moderately injured. Russian state media reported that 600 apartments had been quote handed over. To residents of Mariupol, as the winter season has arrived, during the summer, occupation officials promised to set up widespread warming centers and restore the city's electrical, gas, and water service throughout the city. Only electrical service has come close to being restored, and the promise of widespread housing repairs shrank to 1,500 units by fall. It is unclear why there was a 900-unit building shortfall. But we're willing to bet that somewhere out there, an oligarch is getting his wings, and by wings, I mean a yacht, another one. In northeast Donetsk, on the Donetsk-Luhansk administrative border, fighting on the eastern edge of Vyrnokamyanskia continued. Mercenaries with Wargonzo expressed concern over the situation, stating the Ukrainian forces had a path to move into the edges of Lysychansk. Fighting for control of Bilohorivka, the One in Donetsk and Spirna, led by the private military company or PMC Wagner Group, continued with no change in the situation. Wargonzo reported that Ukrainian efforts were increasing in this area, and that Ukrainian troops were working on starting an advance onto the plateau with a long-term goal of liberating Popasna. There was no reported change in the situation around Solidar and Bakhmut, with fighting still ongoing. Although it continues to be described as intense, it has become positional, with Russian proxy forces fighting over the same two-kilometer strip of territory since September. Weeks ago, we combined the Bakhmut axis into northeast Donetsk, hoping that the section wouldn't sound and read like it's on repeat. But nothing meaningful is being reported. Wargonzo reported fighting within the cities of Solidar and Bakhmut. But there haven't been any other verifiable reports. A video on November 16th, shared by the Luhansk People's Republic or LNR, showed small arms fighting occurring in northern Pokrovsk, suggesting that Russian troops have been pushed completely out of Bakhmutska, except the Novchips sheetrock plant, which straddles Solidar. Russian mill blogger Rybar reported fighting in Opitne, the other Opitne south of Bakhmut. Not the one west of the airport in Vesele near Donetsk. Are you confused? Welcome to our world. There are Russian reports of fighting in both Opitnes in Donetsk, and both are on the current line of conflict. 
don't even get us started on the three Veseles in Donetsk, also on the line of conflict. Although, to be fair, in the United States we have a state, a district, 31 counties, and 88 towns and cities called Washington. In Luhansk, Russian and Ukrainian sources continued to report active fighting near Kuzemivka and Novoselivske along the P7G lock. Fighting was also reported in the area of Stelmachivka, about 13 kilometers west of Svatova. Wargonzo reported that Russian forces attempted to recapture Makivka, but were unsuccessful. It is unclear how large of a force attempted to advance, and the GSAFU did not mention the region in its report. Russian forces claimed they defeated a squad of Ukrainian soldiers attempting to infiltrate Kremina. Entry to Kremina from Rubizhne and Zhitlivka has reportedly been closed. Wargonzo also reported continued fighting for control of Bilohorivka, the one in Luhansk, with Ukrainian forces gaining momentum. Russian mill bloggers reported the town of Kadivka was hit by rockets fired by HIMARS. There was no additional information on the target or damage. HIMARS also destroyed a Russian ammunition depot in Starobilsk. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. Our team of journalists, researchers, and analysts is funded by readers, listeners, and viewers just like you. To support independent journalism, please consider becoming a patron. You can find us on patreon.com at Malcontent News. Moving on to the Cherniev, Kharkiv, and Sumy region, Russian missiles struck a natural gas factory in Izum, causing significant damage and injuring three plant workers. A second barrage was fired at the same facility in what is called a double tap, intended to target rescuers on the scene. Four police officers were injured in that second strike. Some assessment here. With Russian forces targeting critical natural gas infrastructure, it indicates the Russian Ministry of Defense is moving on from electrical generation and distribution to other energy sources in an attempt to freeze the civilian population to death over the coming winter months. Russian sources claimed the Shablinka gas fields and production facilities were heavily damaged after being hit by missiles. While Russia destroys electrical infrastructure, restoration work continues in the recently liberated territories. Electrical power was restored in Borova to 3,000 homes. Dmitry Zhivitsky, Sumy Oblast administrative and military governor, reported the Hromadas of Snobnovhorotsk, Seretina Buda, and Esmen were attacked from across the international border. About 50 artillery shells and mortars were fired across the border, causing no damage. In the Kyiv region, Russia fired two KH-55 cruise missiles at the city of Kyiv, which the German-provided Iris-T air defense system intercepted. Several videos captured the moment of both interceptions from different angles. One of the intercepted missiles could carry a nuclear warhead, but was equipped with a dummy. The nuclear warhead simulator creates the ability to deliver a conventional munition while fooling the missile's electronics. In our assessment, we believe this is a strong indication that the Russian military is running out of precision munitions and is tapping its strategic reserve to continue strikes on Ukraine's energy infrastructure. We do not believe that this was a proof of concept, a test, or a thinly veiled threat. The International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, announced they were sending a safety and security inspection team to Chernobyl, responding to a request from the Ukrainian government. IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi hinted that a permanent presence would be established. Moving on to the Black Sea, Crimea, Mykolaiv, and Odessa region. In Mykolaiv, the seaside town of Kutsrub was struck by S-300 anti-aircraft missiles used for a ground attack. Vitali Kim, Mykolaiv Oblast administrative and military governor, reported there weren't any injuries or significant damage. Also some good news in Mykolaiv, all boiler houses and thermal plants that provide heat and hot water to the city have been repaired after being targeted earlier in the year. The last district in the city was reconnected yesterday. Engineers are also working on restoring water service after Russian forces targeted key water mains in the city over the spring and summer. Two of the four largest water mains have been repaired, with work starting on the last two major sections. Responding to a request from Ukrainian officials, 
The IAEA is sending inspectors to the South Ukraine nuclear power plant in Khmelnytsky, Mykolaiv. Just like at Chernobyl, a team of nuclear safety and security experts plan to stay at the plant for a week, and it was implied that the IAEA would establish a permanent presence. Russian cruise missiles struck an electrical infrastructure facility, reportedly a substation near Odessa, causing severe damage and knocking out power to 700,000 people. In the Black Sea, Russia had six ships on patrol, including three missile carriers capable of launching up to 20 caliber cruise missiles. The flotilla includes two surface ships and a Kilo-class submarine. Our favorite FSB colonel, convicted war criminal, Kremlin pariah and Mobik commander, Igor Gerkenstrelkov, reported that Ekaterina Khubareva, a collaborator from Russian-occupied Kherson, had disappeared on November 16th. Her husband, Pavlo Hubayeve, asked Strelkov to amplify that his wife was missing, and it didn't take long to find her. Hubareva had been arrested by Russian officials and was in jail in Crimea. She's been charged with committing, quote, economic crimes, as reported by Ukrainian and Russian sources, including TASS and RIA Novosti. Hubareva was released, but will face a court hearing in a system with a 99% conviction rate. Reports that Ukrainian drones hit the Russian airbase at Zhankoy in occupied Crimea appear to be fake or very exaggerated. Multiple recycled videos from July and August circulated online, including from reliable sources. There were renewed reports of explosions near Zhankoy at the time of recording. In western and central Ukraine, a dash cam video showed the very moment a Russian cruise missile struck Dnipro, striking a civilian area. The shockwave damaged multiple apartments, wounding 23 people. Two areas of civilian infrastructure were also hit, knocking out power to most of the city as Russia continues its campaign to freeze the population this winter. A missile also hit the natural gas infrastructure in the Pivden Mosh area of the city. A third rocket hit the Pivdeni machine building factory, which makes parts for rockets, aerospace, and defense equipment. Quick sidebar here. We're not sure what Russia was thinking, not only targeting a military facility, but hitting it? The shelling of Nikopol in the Dnipropetrovsk oblast continued, with up to 40 grad rockets fired by MLRS striking the city. Russian forces targeted a solar power plant, power lines, and civilian housing. The IAEA announced they would also establish a safety and security team at the Rivne nuclear power plant, Like the other facilities across Ukraine, inspectors will spend a week at the plant conducting an audit and may establish a permanent presence. IAEA officials also condemned the most recent wave of strikes on Ukrainian energy infrastructure for compromising nuclear safety. The Khmelnytsky nuclear power plant was forced to shut down both reactors and use diesel-powered backup generators after a Russian missile and drone strike knocked out all power connections to the plant. Power was briefly restored, but knocked out again by Russian forces. The plant has since been reconnected to the 330 kilovolt power distribution grid and is no longer on diesel power to maintain cooling. The Rivne nuclear power plant was also disconnected from the 750 kilovolt power grid, forcing one reactor into automatic shutdown and a second to reduce output by 50 percent. Director Grossi said, quote, Yesterday's power loss clearly demonstrates that the nuclear safety and security situation in Ukraine can suddenly take a turn for the worse, including the risk of a nuclear emergency. End quote. Nuclear power plants require an outside source of electrical power as part of the pillars of safety. They can operate in so-called island mode to self-deliver power for plant operations, which is considered inherently dangerous. Nuclear power plants do have emergency generators and must have a minimum of a 10-day on-site fuel supply under nuclear power safety guidelines. Moving on to the Russian front, local residents of Shebekina reported an Iranian-sourced Shahed 136 kamikaze drone malfunctioned and crashed into the city, killing several people. Russian mill blogger Rybar reported that an electrical substation was damaged near Bilgrod, knocking out power to the area. Let's talk about developments theater-wide and outside Ukraine. 
Russia continued its missile strikes on Ukrainian energy infrastructure, civilians, and at least one military target. Officially, the Ukrainian government reported 16 missiles were fired, along with five Shahed-136 kamikaze drones. Other sources estimated the number of missiles and drones was closer to 50. Since November 11th, more than 150 missiles and drones have been fired at Ukraine, including the largest single-day barrage on November 15th. The unrelenting strikes are creating a humanitarian crisis, with over 10 million Ukrainians without power and most of the nation facing rolling blackouts. Up to 50 percent of Ukraine's electrical generation capacity has been destroyed. The general director of Yasno, Serhii Kovalenko, reported that in Kyiv, normal electrical consumption is more than 1,000 megawatts, but the system could only support half that. Customer support centers for Yasno were receiving 10 to 15,000 phone calls per hour. Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, stated that he could not ask Ukrainians to return home since the air defense system cannot protect the Ukrainian skies by at least 90 percent. Ukrainian air defenses have been able to down 70 to 85 percent of incoming missiles over the last month. We had previously written that although NASM's is considered the best air defense solution on the planet, each launcher holds eight missiles. Ukraine currently has two launchers, with six more pending. Because of the limited capacity, large-scale attacks overwhelm the limited deployment. Ukrainian officials and the Pentagon reported that NASM's has been 100 percent effective, and Ukrainian officials have reported Iris-T is also 100 percent effective. There just aren't enough air defense assets. Investigators have reached a preliminary conclusion that the missile that landed in Poland was a stray S-300 anti-aircraft missile fired by Ukraine in a ground-to-air capacity. Social media reports and photos that debris from a Russian KH-101 missile had also been found nearby were inaccurate. President Zelensky insisted that the missile did not come from Ukraine, likely echoing what his military leaders were telling him in private. Jakub Komoch, head of the International Policy Bureau in the Chancellery of the President of Poland, announced that a Polish-American investigative team is working at the scene of the missile crash. Komoch stressed that no one believes or is accusing Ukraine of a deliberate act, and world leaders have stated that the ultimate responsibility lies with Russia due to its widespread terror attacks. Ukraine demanded to be part of the investigation, and Kumok later announced that Ukrainian officials would join the team. On Thursday, Andrzej Duda, president of Poland, said that he understands the position of President Zelensky and the situation is emotional for both leaders. Duda said, quote, This is an extremely difficult situation for Ukraine. Emotions are running high and there is an enormous amount of stress. It doesn't surprise anyone that emotions are running high, that the president's, he means Zelensky's, emotions are running high. The president is deeply concerned about what is happening to his people, who have elected him to this position and to whom he feels responsible. End quote. Duda added that Poland believes that regardless of the missile's origin, it was not an intentional attack on the NATO nation. On the same day a Russian cruise missile armed with a dummy nuclear warhead was shot down over Kyiv, Ukraine held a nuclear strike preparedness drill in the free areas of Donetsk. The drill simulated a tactical nuclear strike on an infrastructure facility and involved multiple agencies, including medical staff. The Verkhovna Rada, Ukrainian parliament, approved the ratification of Bill 173, which creates a memorandum of bilateral cooperation between Ukraine and NATO. The first agreement between Ukraine and NATO was signed in 2015, with NATO promising cooperation to help Ukraine modernize its military information technology and communication services. What's new is old Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told President Zelensky that he would, quote, sort out the issue of providing air defense weapons or technology to Ukraine and, quote, get back with a response. There are reports that Israeli officials have agreed amongst themselves to provide air defense weapons to Ukraine, and an announcement could come as early as today. The report was in numerous Israeli publications. The Wall Street Journal reported that the Iranian-built Mohajer 6 UAV includes parts from Israel, and up to 75 percent of the electronics come from the United States. Dmitry Kuleba, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, 
has requested the United States provide Patriot anti-aircraft defense systems to Ukraine after Thursday's attack on the nation. The United States and other NATO nations have been reluctant to provide certain weapon systems out of concern that Russia could see the deployment as an escalation. The Lithuanian people crowdsourced $250,000 to purchase an unmanned surface vessel, or UAF, and named the drone Peace. The money will fund the production of the same drones used to attack the Black Sea Fleet on October 29th. There are reports that Croatia is working on a three-nation deal to provide Ukraine with 14 Mi-8 helicopters in exchange for Black Hawk helicopters from the United States. Croatian Minister of Defense Mario Banozic stated that the fleet of choppers is slated to be retired in 2026, and Ukraine was running out of parts to keep them flying. The United States did not comment on the report. In our War Crimes and Human Rights segment, we discuss events that might be upsetting to hear about. There is some graphic detail in today's report, and if you are sensitive to descriptions of human rights abuses, please feel free to skip ahead to the next segment. Timestamps are in the description. Ukrainian officials announced they had found two more torture chambers in the Kherson area as investigations continue. Dmitry Lubinets, the Ukrainian parliament's commissioner for human rights, said there was confirmation that Ukrainian citizens were killed after being tortured in Kherson by electrical shocks, beatings with pipes, and bones broken. Denis Monostrysky, the head of the Ministry of Internal Affairs, reported that the bodies of 63 torture victims had been found across the Kherson Oblast in 11 different locations. It appears Russian troops gassed some of their victims as they had done in Izum, which was occupied about a month after Kherson. The G20 released a joint statement condemning the missile attacks on Ukraine. The text notes that, quote, "...the majority of member states strongly condemn the war in Ukraine and emphasize that it is causing enormous suffering and worsening existing problems in the global economy." End quote. I mean, that sounds really nice, right? But there is also a passage about, quote, "...differences of opinion regarding the situation and sanctions." End quote. It also says that international law should be followed, and threats to use nuclear weapons are unacceptable. Ukraine repatriated 103 children who had been illegally deported to Russia. Over 11,000 children remain in Russia after deportation, and Russian officials have been naked in exposing the illegal adoptions and ongoing so-called re-education. In Kupyansk, war crime investigators were exhuming a body in a yard when Russian forces shelled the city. Sadly, a round hit the property where the body was buried, destroying a part of a home and decapitating the 76-year-old woman who lived there. One of the investigators was badly injured by shrapnel in the same blast. A court in the Netherlands found Igor Girkin Strelkov guilty of 298 counts of murder for the 2014 downing of flight MH17 in eastern Ukraine. Sergei Dubinsky and Ukrainian Leonid Karchenko were also found guilty. The court determined the trio were illegal combatants in their findings and had no right to operate an anti-aircraft system or target military aircraft, let alone civilians. Stressing that the defendants knew that launching the missile would lead to people's deaths, the judge said, quote, Karchenko reported to Dubinsky about the use of anti-aircraft missiles and then carried out the order to take them out, end quote. The court also believes that the intention to shoot down military rather than civilian aircraft does not reduce the guilt of the accused. Quote, the accused, who are not combatants, did not have the right to attack a military plane as well. End quote. The court ruled that Girkin did not order Flight MH17 to be shot down, but was complicit in the crime and bore the same responsibility as Karchenko and Dubinsky. A fourth defendant, Oleg Pulitov, was acquitted of charges because he was not involved in the activity of shooting down an aircraft and only ordered the Russian Federation provided a Buk-1 launcher relocated. In geopolitical news, European Union foreign policy chief Josep Borrell said peace talks between Russia and Ukraine are impossible because, quote, Russia is not ready. Borrell told Reuters, quote, I am afraid Russia is not ready to withdraw. And as far as it doesn't withdraw, peace will not be possible. It is Russia who has to make peace possible. 
the aggressor has to withdraw if he wants sustainable peace. End quote. The Chamber of Deputies of the Parliament of the Czech Republic has approved a resolution that calls the current Russian government a terrorist regime. The measure passed with 129 of the 156 parliament members voting in favor of the resolution. Olga Richterova, deputy spokesperson for the Chamber of Deputies, said, quote, Vladimir Putin and the people controlled by him started the war. They have the blood of thousands of civilians on their hands. The Kremlin's actions are reminiscent of the darkest days of Stalin's era. End quote. In economic news, the ruble was unchanged with an exchange rate of 60 for one U.S. dollar. Global oil prices are approaching $85 a barrel, a critical benchmark for Russian oil sales to be profitable on the world market. WTI crude fell to $81 a barrel, and Brent dropped to $88 a barrel. United States wholesale RBOB gasoline on the spot market was stable at $2.45 per gallon for November contracts, or $0.65 cents a liter. Dutch TTF gas futures for December 2022 remained highly volatile, dropping sharply again to 110 euros per megawatt hour. January 2023 contracts were also down, trading at 117 euros. Chicago SRW wheat futures climbed to $8.32 a bushel for March 2022 contracts. And that's what we know. Join me again tomorrow for more updates. Until then, stay safe, everyone. You've been listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. To help keep us independent, please consider providing financial support by becoming a patron. Want on-demand news in your hand? Download the Google News app and make Malcontent News one of your favorites to receive breaking news updates. Thank you for listening.